I'd like you to all join me and welcome Olaf Alexander Boo. I'll start by standing and then I might sit down a little bit later. But um, it's nice to see so many people here, uh, that's for sure. Um, as the title indicates, data powered performance, I think um, a lot of our, what we have got a lot of attention for over the last years is obviously that we have been using a lot of data and we do. Uh, but I think there are two important data streams that it's important for me to communicate and that is that there is one quantitative data stream which basically is all the sensors that we have here moxie core u2 master and so on but there is also another data stream that also we, we must not forget and which is very important and that is the qualitative data stream that actually comes from the athletes also so very often when we use tools it's you can imagine when you're out riding with your power meter and you were riding blind if somebody asked you whether you could feel the difference between let's say 300 watts and 290 watts there was a lot of noise here or not is it okay okay um and that is that if you go out and you go riding 290 watts or you go riding 300 watts it's quite difficult to feel the difference between that unless you really have practiced a lot around 290 and 300 watts still there are several percent differences between the two um, and what we do see is that even for elite athletes that f feeling this difference is quite difficult if you don't have instruments to calibrate your feeling with regularly. So for example, um, when, I, if, when we, I started working with Christian and Gustav uh, in particular, this was in 2016, we, went, uh, we even used more lactate than we do today because this was fairly new to them and they had, there was a lot to be learned, even for the athletes. And of course, this, we had a fantastic 2017 and when 2018 come, uh, we thought, okay, now, now we have used this instrument so much that how much do we really, do, can, we, can we take it away and not use it so much? The interesting thing to see is that athlete starts to drift away from that feeling. So Christian, typically, he started to train harder. On the, so on the same set, so where we were looking to develop something specific, Christian started to drift and he started to push a little bit harder. Well, actually, the funny thing is with Gustav, he ends up going a little bit easier on those, let's say, specific sessions. But when you are using instruments uh, regularly, this is basically when you can start to calibrate your feeling. You don't want to look at the instruments all the time, but you want to have, give them a glimpse and then you, from experience, you know from all the sessions that you have accumulated, okay, I know that I can stay around here and this is a safe place to stay. You give it a, you give it a small glimpse and you say, okay, I'm where I am. And then you go back and you feel, how does this feel? And this is where, how we very often use instruments most of the time. Um, What's interesting now is, of course, that we have three brands here, which is, have been quite crucial for us, both in the lead up to uh, the Olympics, uh, but also now uh, continuing. This is actually, uh, now this has been a long distance year, but where we had to learn very quickly. We went from Olympic. Uh, none have before won, gone from the Olympic distance racing to Ironman racing and won in the same year. We. Chris, I remember Christian was joking a little bit about this before, um, just before actually Olympics. He said that after Olympics, I'm gonna race Kona and I'm gonna win. That's what, that was what he said. Um, and uh, we were sitting and joking a little bit about this. And then he, um, then I said, you, you know that the fastest somebody have won the Ironman after the Olympics is that taking them three to four years to, to, to go from Olympic distance to Ironman distance. And then he said, yeah, yeah, but we're using all the science. Three to four months is more than enough. <laughs> that was how it was. So fast forward, of course, it was uh, for both Gustav and for Christian, it was a uh, debut uh, where both of them set the fastest time as a debutant and even Christian went the fastest ever in an Ironman uh, race. Um, and I, the only way, the only reason for why we could get there was exactly because we used instruments and more importantly, we used all these instruments in the field to learn as quickly as possible what was going on in the body. It was not that we went in and we, had a, we were determined that this is how it should look like, but rather allowing the athletes to perform and adjust and then see, okay, what, 
what does this look for, what does this look like in terms of performance because there is, what you'll see is that if you, if you if I gave you the program for example for Christian one first of all you will see that it's not the same program it changes and it changes and it changes because Christian is changing both from an exp getting more experience but also because he has a now the, from every race we are accumulating of course also things changes and that means that if, if and if you look at Christian and Gustav you'll see two very different body types too and that means also that there needs to be a part of individualization and that means also that what I call individual performance signature it is individual when you when you perform what is the signature of when you really perform this is unique to each individual and this is what we really need to spend or today I need to spend a lot of time on analyzing this and now we are working of course on automating more of these processes and feeding uh, the algorithms more and more with the knowledge that we are gaining but in order to allow us to even expand the use of sensors so back to one of the things that I I'm not sure if this one follow me do I have a pen here yes I have um, is it me that I'm making all the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably me. It doesn't make it all the time. Um, if you hold it closer, we can make it. Okay. Okay, so uh, the difference is, I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the three products that are here today. View to Master. Everybody knows what it does, yeah? Or just to give a quick heads up. You know, when we go into a lab, all the way back, decades, several decades, maybe soon, even a millennia, people have tried to understand performance or human physiology, and we actually measured, we have measured oxygen uptake for decades. Um, what's interesting to see is that people still today, they go into a lab, and they're trying to understand performance and they're still measuring the view to max. Uh, and I'm gonna go, come back a little bit to that. But the one thing we have to remember and which you probably all have heard, and that is that for some reason, it seems that view to max alone is not a good predictor of performance. It's a indicator, but not necessarily the one that, that if you have the highest view to max, you're also be going to be the one that is the, being the fastest. And that is because there are other things also that really matters. First of all, VU to max is just a power metric. It has nothing to do with capacity at all. And what I mean by that is that you can two athletes in a lab and you test them and you find out, let's say they have an oxygen uptake of 80 milliliters per minute per kilogram. But one person can hold that for three minutes, another one can hold it for six minutes. That's a 100% difference in capacity or 50% depending on which direction you go. So obviously you see already there, there's a big difference to two persons with exactly the same view to max. Further, uh, we know that of course, with their, in Ironman racing, or we have something that we also call fraction utilization of oxygen. And that's, for example, interesting at the at, at, uh, race pace. And for an Ironman athlete, compared to an Olympic athlete, you, you are gonna race very steady for those eight hours or seven and a half hours you're racing, you're gonna race very steady. If you're gonna do a lot of surges, that's going to impair your speed, or let's say your average speed, quite heavily. Uh, I think that the racing will change. It's starting to change a little bit, and it will continue to change, but it's not going to be the same as short course racing, where there are much more dynamics, just because you need, you can't really have uh, a very, let's say, powerful glycolytic system that allows you to do a lot of surges and these kind of things. So uh, what the view to master allows us to do is that when we are out in the field and we are racing or when we are training, it allows us to suddenly bring a system where we, where, I, where we are in a lab and we are measuring in a very out of context environment. We can be out in, the lab, out in the field, we can measure on the bike, we can measure on the run, we can even measure on the swim, suddenly the, view, the oxygen consumption of the athletes. And the two most important things I would say there for me, from a, let's say from a, when I want to adjust the performance, understand the performance of the athletes are two things. View to max, of course, it is interesting. Uh, but we also have to remember that uh, What's, this is much more plastic that we have than we ever have thought before. Uh, I can let you in on a small secret, and that is one of the things that changed with Christian when we, let, when we went into Cosmo, and which both surprised me and several of the team that I have around me with physiologists and so on, 
is that we actually had to reduce the view to max of Christian quite substantially for him to actually be fast enough in an Ironman. And the reason for that, we don't know 100% yet, but we have some theories for why you're racing faster in Ironman with a lower view to max than necessarily what you do for an Olympic racing. Christian, Gustav, they are the highest. Uh, we did a five week intervention just to see how high we could bring it in, a, in five weeks time. This was during COVID, there were no competition. Christian and Gustav normally always leading into Olympic races. They were racing around 87 to 89 milliliters per minute per kilogram. That's where they were staying. But now Christian said that, or Gustav said that they wanted to be in the 90 club. So we took a five week intervention. Anyway, there were no competition, nothing we needed to specialize for. So we did a five week intervention and they clocked in at 93 milliliter per minute per kilogram. We know that we could have brought it even much higher if that had been the sole intention of it. But at the same time, also the other way when we are going into, uh, but they are not racing the fastest at 93 milliliter per minute per kilogram. Uh, that seems to be around 87 for, or let's say between 85 and 90 milli milliliter per minute per kilogram for these athletes. Um, when we went for Cosmel, it was significantly lower. Uh, and the reason for this and why it's so interesting then to be able to measure view to max in the field for us is that we can start to understand this from, let's say, from a systemic perspective. I like normally to think of this in that in the end here, there's an output. And this one is I'm writing like a crow, I hope you can read. <laughs> Velocity or speed. That's the only thing that matters in the end. It doesn't matter if you have 150 milliliter per minute per kilogram if you're racing slower than your grandmother. <clears throat> Between here, what we normally do measure today, and today we can measure it also on running, and that is of course power, or to be more specific, mechanical power. So what we do understand also here is that there's an efficiency factor between these two. <clears throat> so you can produce a lot of power, but you're sitting very upright and you're pushing a lot of air, which is not very ideal, obviously. At the same time also, you can try to optimize your aerodynamics extremely much, but it will also cut off your power too, or let's say your, so at least your sustainable power. But that's just work economy. When we look at it more from a, what I like to call biomechanical perspective, also what also happens is that when you have a much more acute angle, for example, is that it will also impair actually how you are producing power. When we look at a power meter, what we have to remember is that it actually outputs your one hertz, or let's say one hertz, that's what it outputs. In between there, there is something called intracyclic power, which you can measure if you have an extremely high resolution power meter. So when you are measuring power, you'll normally see that there's a curve that goes something like this. And it's the average power of this curve here that is basically output on your computer. But what we do understand when we start to measure this is that power can be produced in a whole lot of different ways. You can have a huge spike up here, but you also have a rather big dip on the other side here, which is basically subtracting, subtracting your power. The other thing also is that you can have a more flat curve and so on. But the whole point, the whole point is that there are many ways also to produce power. And this has to do with your biomechanical efficiency and so on. And this is something that we can understand when we are measuring an output and an input. But in reality, this is not really not your input either. There, to be able to produce power, there has to come, then the power has to come from somewhere. And if, you're, if you have been, for those of you that have maybe studied a little bit into physiology, we know that basically the muscles, the, 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 the energy that the muscles are basically using to produce power is ATPs. So you have to convert fats, carbohydrates into, into, uh, into ATP, which basically is what the muscles is using to produce power. And there is a bigger brother to mechanical power, and that's actually thermal power, and something we are working with core on measuring. But that means also before here that there is something we can measure here, and that's the metabolic power, or let's say your VO2, but me metabolic power. And again here, there's also an efficiency factor. But it means basically that there is no velocity without power and there's no power without calories. You have to burn something. So VO2, when you're measuring oxygen uptake, we're actually measuring how much you are able to 
burn. When we are meshing these two, which is more universal because this one will be a little bit more independent on whether you're riding uphill, downhill and these kind of things because speed will obviously, you can go quite fast downhill without producing any power and you can go very slow uphill if it's just steep enough while you're still producing a lot of power. This one is a little bit more universal but it's still influenced by this one. So this one actually will quite significantly change and this is also one of the things when athletes feel that they maybe are more efficient going uphill or they feel they can push more power when they go uphill. That's not for everybody, actually. There is a difference. There are some athletes that actually push more power when they go flat or even, even slightly, slightly downhill too because they get, a, they have a, they get some help from, from inertia and other things that allows them to pedal more efficiently. So this is also different from person to person. But again, when you're measuring these two, you'll see that for an untrained athlete, the ratio between these two is fairly poor. But for a high performance athlete, this is very high. And one of the things that actually happened when I started to work with Christian was that I started to look, for example, on all these kind of things. And again, I don't use, it would be, for me, it's pretty obscure to go into a laboratory and testing your VO2 max to determine your performance when you're already running on a treadmill. I can actually just look at your speed because in the end, the speed is what matters. So if you have two athletes and one is running at 85 milliliter per minute per kilogram, and he's running 20 kilometers per hour, and you have another one that's running at 80, km, 80 milliliter per minute per kilogram, but he's running at 22 kilometers per hour, it would be crazy to say that, okay, you got five, 85 milliliter per minute per kilogram, you're gonna win the race when the other one is running faster. And that is because this one only tells us about how much energy we're able to turn around, but not how much comes out into speed unless we measure this as well, and or power for that sake. Christian, when I started working with him, he had a biochemical efficiency of around 17%. So that means that off, to make it simple, to make it simple, that means that for him, of the 100% that comes out here, 17% <clears throat> was mechanical and 83% was, was heat. If we know that for elite cyclists, for example, or also because I measure other athletes too, triathletes too, <clears throat> we see that some of the most efficient ones are sitting around 20 to 21%. This depends on the sport that you are doing. It's not so that you can just say that again, if that's what, we, that's what I heard, so then we just apply it to all sports. It will be very different compared to what sport you're doing. The thing is that increasing, now Christian sits around 19%. Gustav is around 20. <clears throat> but in order, if you go from 19 to 20%, that's not a 1% increase. So if you're able to convert one more of these percents into mechanical power, that's not a 1%, that's a 5% increase in performance. If I wanted to, 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 to make the same change here now, that means basically that I would need to increase the view to max of the athletes by 5%. And probably that wouldn't be even enough either. The heart is actually grossly inefficient. So having a huge heart is not something that is, comes for free because the bigger the stroke volume, one of the things we know from studies that has been done is that the heart has in the average population an efficiency of around 10%. I'm gonna say something first, very first, just so that you know where I come from. And there are, there are two fundamental laws. One is the first law of thermodynamic. And the second one being the stationary action principle. What this means is that on the one side here, you can't destroy energy, you can't create energy, you can only convert energy from one form to another form. Meaning in this context, we are, com we are converting calories to speed. That's why there are no, ca there are no speed without calories. Uh, the second thing being is that the body will always, everything in nature will basically try to solve a task as cheaply as possible. <clears throat> so when you are trying to adapt to something, that's why also we, when I see a lot of athletes when they are preparing for races and other things, they start to do uh, at least a lot of training that I don't believe too much in because I'm a firm believer of that the body is extremely adaptable and it adapts towards what you want to be good at. 
So you'll not find Christian and Gusta starting to do a lot of like 30 seconds intervals uh, all out, tens of them or something like this leading into a race because it's so far away from what they're actually going to do in a race that why would I try to train them for something that they're not going to be good at. So the closer we get into a race, the more specific the training has to be because we need to adapt to it. In the same way that when you come to Hawaii, you probably feel that it's very uncomfortable to be here in the heat the first days but as you stay here for, for a week two weeks it starts to be more comfortable and that's because the body adapts to it the body is extremely adaptable and that's also the reason that's also it comes back to the station action principle or in other words the law of least action if you take a glass of water you pour it down a hill the water will find the easiest way to run down the hill there and the body will also try to figure out how it can basically if you're running at 15 kilometer per hour, the body will basically try to adapt to figuring out how, how can I basically supply the body with enough energy or as little as possible energy so that I can run 15 kilometer per hour. And that's where the adaptation spe specificity comes in. So how, how so to, to be more than more practical, again, we know that having a big heart, and that's also some of the explanation probably for why you can't have or why it's very hard to hold up a very high view to max leading into a race like Ironman. Just to simplify that part, if you basically plot your five minute power, so these are basically five minute powers. So if we say that there are 200 watts there, 300 watts here, 400 watts there, and 500 watts, and we basically say that uh, uh, for this athlete, let's say, we say, uh, 85 so that would be let's say 45 something here anyway the thing is that if you plot 5 minute power and you increase your 5 minute power there's a fairly straight correlation between your 5 minute power and VO2 max. It's a simple way of indirectly testing your, testing your VO2 max is actually go out and do a five minute all out workout. You have a pretty good approximation of your VO2 max. Again, back to specificity. You're not gonna do five minute efforts in an Ironman. If you're gonna do that, you're gonna at least gonna lose out on a lot of spots in front of you that you could have taken if you spent more of your time specify or training specifically for an Ironman. So that means that again here also, there. You have to train for what you want to be good at. When you are training for what you want to go be good at and you're getting closer and closer to an Ironman, you're doing more specific work. That means also that your view to max not natural will come down. It's just a natural consequence. And the reason why it's a natural consequence is basically that also that if you have a power curve, uh, no matter whether you draw it this way, uh, logarithmic or uh, hyperbolic, it's basically what you'll see here also is that when we are training, we have a certain budget each week that we can expend on training. That means that you, if you have 10 hours available for training and what you're going to do is spending those 10 hours trying to increase your five minute power, it means very little training out here. So your curve will probably look very impressive on the, on, on the, on the short duration side. But on the Ironman side, it's going to look really bad because that's going to happen out here. So if this is your, let's say, your five-minute, uh, five-hour power, and your five-minute power sits somewhere here, again, this is a logarithmic curve. This is not what you want it to look when you go into a race. If you have ten hours, that means that you need to basically try to optimize for what you can do out here, trying to do something with more longer duration workouts and so, and that means that naturally. This one will then start to improve. Obviously, we, we, we improve on what we train for. If you work on your swimming, you become good at swimming, not at running. And if you do running, you're not gonna get good at swimming. So obviously, specificity goes everywhere. But the consequence of this is because we are now expending more of the time we have available to specify, to train here, we're gonna get a curve that looks more maybe something like this, to exaggerate a little bit. It's just how it is. If you've got 20 hours for training, it means you can spend more time optimizing some of the training also here because at some point we can basically say that your threshold power or your race power in Ironman is never going to be higher than your threshold power 
and the threshold power is never going to be higher than your VO2 max. So we just need to ensure that at least the VO2 max doesn't become a limitation for your threshold and that your threshold doesn't become a limitation for your raised power. But again, key, the, the specific, key, uh, specificity is key. Um, yes. Um, so for us, being able to use VO2 master in field and check what is really happening there has been extremely important for us because it allows us to understand what is really happening in the body. And then of course, as we collect more data, we know how we fast they can bring the atheists from one to another form. The funny thing is actually, I should be careful by saying this, but this is actually the race we are actually coming the least prepared to of all the Ironman races we have done the last year now. For Cozumel, we had a long period of, of two, three months, two months where we basically spe specified spe for, for Cozumel. And obviously it was a first race so we needed to do that. St. George, we got, we got equally much time or even more time to really take the learning that we got from Cozumel and really put it into uh, and, 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 and try to even improve it going into uh, St. George. Or, unfortunately, they both got sick Christian just got ready to be okay to start. Gustav could not start at that, uh, that day. Now, the whole point with this year was that they were gonna do this, uh, these races. Sub seven was gonna be the last long race for them. And then we would gradually go back to the Olympic racing. Of course, Kona came and we said, okay, this is a historic opportunity to be here. Obviously going back to the roots of triathlon and racer. So they wanted to do one more race, but we had a sprint distance race in Bergen in the end of August. So 28th of August, Christian, we, we, we work because obviously it's a hometown and it's important. They really want to perform there as well. Christian came uh, second. Unfortunately, Gustav just lost out, out on the swim and ended up in a group uh, back. But uh, both of them performed quite well. So we saw how quickly we could bring them back to the most extreme the other direction again. Now, of course, going in here, what we have is more experience, so we compensate maybe with a little bit of lack of speci special or specificity by more experience. So that's of course a good thing. But being able to understand this for us have allowed us basically to see how quickly the body adapts. Not only from a, if I only measure the power curve, I don't know how quickly the metabolism changes. And this is what I can use the view to master and the moxie for to, to understand much better. Um, and that's why also one thing that we do when we are traveling so much across different climates too, for example, and now we are in the heat and so on. One of the things that we, I can just take this, when heart rate, everybody here is familiar with heart rate, obviously. But heart rate, what we don't know when you're measuring heart rate, This is the one that actually is important. Or we can measure it with VO2, but we can also me measure it with cardiac output. This requires extremely invasive methods to measure. So we are measuring it with heart rate instead. But in order to reach this, there is also a stroke volume component in there, which is important. And this is of course what is being drive up mainly when you're increasing your five minute power. It's basically the stroke volume that mainly changes. Um, when we're measuring heart rate, the problem is that this one is affected by a lot, whole lot of different components, everything from plasma to other things. So for example, if you go to altitude, one of the first things that happens is that you're reducing your plasma content. If you're reducing your plasma content, that means also that your cardiac output will normally be reduced for the same heart rates. So for, because the stroke volume goes down or plasma volume goes down, so cardiac output goes down. So heart rate needs to be, be higher now. There are other things also being that also affects heart rate, uh, partial pressure and other things. But one thing that we do see when we are at altitude and we are, for example, targeting different powers is that you can't go to altitude and expect to be racing at your race power. You need to adjust for it somehow. And one of the things we do see is that, for example, Christian, Gustav, if they sit around, for example, for an Ironman race, they can sit around probably a couple of four, this depends a little bit on where we are and so, but prob when we are testing, we see normally around 40%. This is data we can co accumulate over time. We can just put them on them and as they are training, 
and they have good session. Again, the qualitative qualitative feedback is really important. And at least I, I see from other measurements we do also, they say that, okay, this is really, today I really felt good. I see from the data, we know from the speed, everything, that this looks really good. We can also start to look at SMO2 concentration. What was the SMO2, SMO2 concentration at that point? And this again allows us to target and we are breaking up into intervals, we are going to other climate, we can basically use that SMO2 value and target that. And the interesting thing with that is that on this curve, we can also plot SMO2 curves if we really want to do that in correlation with the power curve or the power data. But for Christian and Gustav sitting around, just using use a number 40% at race pace. If they go to altitude and they target 40% SMO2 there, that means basically that the power has to come down. You can't go with the same power anymore because you don't have access to the same amount of oxygen per liter of air you're breathing compared to a sea level. So when we have that on there now, one of the things that is interesting is actually that when we started using the MOXIE monitor in, I think this was back in 2015, after I've been screening a lot of different devices that was on the market, we ended up using the MOXIE for two reasons. One, it was the one that was able to reproduce, or we, we saw basically correlated the best all the time with all the sensors we were using. So it was stable and robust in that sense. And we got the data straight into the Garmin so they could have the data field on the Garmin and look at that in the same way as heart rate. Um, and I basically specifically said to them in the beginning when we introduced new sensors, I said that you don't don't look at it, or you can look at the numbers, but you don't gonna do anything. You're gonna use the metrics that we're used to use. So of course we use a lot of lactate. They were climbing hills and all these kind of things and up the mountains, typically one place we go very often for training is here in Nevada. There you can go down to Granada, which is around eight, 900 meters altitude. And then we bike all the way up to 2,300 meter, even up to 2,500 meter where there's a gate. When they go up there, one of the things, if you go now up and we, when we do the testing in the lab and we have found out, okay, this is approximately where your, let's say, maximum active steady state heart rate sits, if we're going to have a long uphill threshold session or maximum active steady state session. One of the things that, do, that did, we noticed was that when they targeted, because we knew that we couldn't go by the same power all the way up to the top, we obviously needed another metric to use it. So heart rate was a metric that we could use, we thought. Going up there, typically the data or the heart rate corresponded pretty well with lactate or the same thing that we had found when we done the profiles up to approximately 1800 meter. But when we passed 1800 meter, 1900 meter, typically we saw that there, it didn't correlate anymore. One thing that the athletes really started to discover was that they saw that when we adjusted back with lactate to the value that they had, and of course they now couldn't use the same heart rate, they saw the SMO2 value stayed more or less the same as we were climbing up the mountain. And the athletes, without telling me, I just saw that, okay, they are becoming really good at, at pacing, obviously because the lactate values and other things there starts to look very sound, approximately where we want to target it. And then they, then they tell me, yeah, what we see is that the SMO2 value stays very consistent when we are measuring the lactate. And suddenly we have a real-time device. Because the problem with lactate is that if you are riding and there is a, it's not like a constant uphill, but there's a little bit changing in terrain and other thing, and you're not extremely well at pacing yourself. If you're doing a 10-minute interval, and during the last minute, you're having a little bit of a dip in power, and you surge back up again that's gonna influence the measurement that you're gonna end. You, go, you don't get a real reflection of the load that you had over the last 10 minutes. Secondly, lactate is heavily also affected by your plasma in the body. So one of the first things that happens when you go to altitude is that you actually are losing plasma. You are getting more dehydrated, you're losing plasma, and because you now have less blood in your body, that means also that the lactate concentration will start to come up as a function of it. So what you thought where your, let's say your maximum lactate steady state concentration is actually not your maximum lactate steady state concentration anymore. It's affected by hydration and a lot of different things. SMO2 isn't. And this is the really interesting thing because we see that basically if you do a search, well, you see it from the, the data. The SMO2 value comes up and it goes down and down again as you pace yourself correctly. So again, there we suddenly had a device that allowed us to really start to pace and target metabolic power much more accurately compared to if we used power meters and of course speed in itself. So these two devices of course is something we use, you'll see them use them more or less on most of the sessions, especially on bike sessions, run sessions, sometimes they, they use it, sometimes we, they don't use it depending on a little bit what we do, but that's because it's a little bit more 
uh, complicated to use it uh, on the running. Well, that's not right. Uh, it just takes a little bit more preparation. You'll need to use a patch normally to put out. And of course, now there's a shorts too that can be used as well uh, to, to, to keep it in the same spot. And that's important to, to keep in mind. When you find, in the beginning, when you start to use the Moxie, you, you will start to play around a little bit. And the reason for why you want to stay to play around with it is basically that there are two things that you want to see. One is that basically when you are doing a range of efforts, you want to see a high dynamic range. So if you're starting to do something fairly hard, let's say high intensity intervals, you want to see basically SMO to drop very quickly. Then you know that you, are, that, that you have found a good position. Secondly, also, as you basically stop the interval and you're doing rest and all things, you also want to see the SMO to come up to fairly high values too. So you have a good dynamic range. If you don't have a good dynamic range, then I would basically start to play around a little bit until you find a good position to keep the moxie on. When you, found, when you find that, either tattoo in a real way you put it, or use the short, or just be very, uh, that you are good at keeping it that spot to, to, to be able to make sense of the data, or keep data consistent. It's the same thing with all kind of devices. Power meter also, if you don't calibrate and you go from a cold climate to a warm climate and you don't calibrate it, it's not going to stay consistent. It's going to drift, even with the new temperature compensated power meters. Um, finally, the core. Um, I remember uh, uh, this was in 2018. I don't know how many hundred or 10,000 of euros I spent on temperature pills for my athletes. Um, and they have to, I can let you in on a small secret, they have to insert it rectally, they are not allowed to swallow them. Um, simple reason, because data consistency is important. Uh, and if you swallow the pill, uh, you don't know necessarily how far it has gone down your tract, and that means also if you're drinking fluids and other things that can, in, that can impact the temperature data that you're getting from the pill. Of course, the further down it is into your column, the less affected it will be, but then it's super safe just to take the pill, put up back and you're done. Then it, it works straight out. Um, but again, doing this on each session, I remember even a colleague asked, uh, which was not too much into physiology, but was more on the financial side and asked, is it not possible to reuse these pills? Um, and uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Um, or you can, but I'm not sure who gonna put the pill back up again after. His, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure Gustav is gonna accept the pill from Christian or vice versa. Uh, so uh, I was introduced. It was Dan Laurent, a very close friend of mine. He uh, introduced me to kindly to to the guys at Core and said they are making now a sensor that you can put in your skin to measure your core temperature. And then I think, okay, th this I've heard before uh, because it's. It has not been a lack of patches that you can put on your body to measure your temperature. The thing is that most of these devices, the way they do it is that they have, based on studies, they look at the core, they're measuring the core temperature, obviously by rectal probe, for example, and looking at the skin temperature and you create an offset between, a statistical offset between the two. So you know that, for example, if you're measuring at the forehead, then you know that, okay, that's the offset between forehead and basically your core temperature is this. But the problem is that this is not very accurate. It's good for diagnostic purposes where you just want to check, okay, do you have a fever or not, for example. But for us, where we need to really understand heat adaptation, the smallest changes that are happening in this kind of thing, we need something that's more accurate. And of course, the pills are accurate. What we further, so when I met with Core, uh, I remember that I was uh, very open, was very curious to see how they had sort of approaches. And suddenly I learned that the way they are doing it is that there actually is two measurements going on. And the one measurement is of course is measuring the, the core, no, no, the skin, skin temperature of you. But the other thing is actually measuring is actually how much heat is actually your body producing. And the interesting thing is that that's also the thermal power. So if you have, if you have, uh, you can imagine this, if I asked uh, Chris and Chris, and I said, guys, I want to really know what are my plate at home. So if I have a plate at home, I'm gonna cook my potatoes there, for example, I put it onto two kilowatts, I could actually take this sensor, not the plastic version, but if it was made in metal, put it on there, and I could actually accurately measure 
the power output from this base. So if I put it on two kilowatts, I will be able to measure that. Yes, there is actually two kilowatts of power coming there. And this is actually the same. When we're measuring power on a bike, it's mechanical power, but it's, it's power. It comes from somewhere and it comes from calories. So when I started to understand this, of course, suddenly there was a sensor here that not only allowed me to be able to look at the core temperature, but indirectly, because it measures indirectly, but it doesn't do it the way that all, all others do. It does it, but it actually measures the thermal power and the skin temperature. What we need to remember is that there will not necessarily, when you're measuring here, you're not measuring here. And when you're, that means also that the body doesn't have a uniform temperature either. There, there are small changes in temperature across the body. So that means also when we're measuring here, we can't necessarily just take the data from the rectal probe and just transfer it straight over to the values we get there. We have to establish new baselines and so on. But that you do very quickly because when you do exercises and all this kind of thing, you start to get a temperature range as well. So again, it's about understanding, of course. And when we talk about gold standards too, we have to remember that a gold st we, we very seldom have gold standards. Even measuring VO2 max is not the gold standard. The only way we could really know 100% accurately how much oxygen you're breathing is that we actually had to burn all the oxygen that comes out of your mouth. There's the only way we would know 100% accurately how much oxygen you have been consuming. Of course, that's a very invasive way, so it's not a very practical or extremely impractical way of doing it. So obviously we need some other methods to do it. And the view to master has the exact same devices internally that is used in a lab cart. Why can it be so little? Well, that's because in the same way that the Apollo 11 expedition had the computing power that was uh, probably today not even a billion, a billionth time of your iPhone, things have advanced really fast. Things have become much more. If you look at a mobile phone 20 years ago, it was big as a suitcase, today is small. Metabolic cards they're used in hospital settings, they're made actually for clinical setting, hospital settings, and there, are no, there is no motivation to really reduce the size of these because miniaturization of components is actually something that's very costly. That's where, of course, Peter and his team came into the market because they basically saw there's an open space there where you can basically take and miniaturize the devi device with no cables or anything, and, and the reason why it really is good for us. The same also now when we can take the, view to the, the, the core from GreenTech 2, there's suddenly we don't have to spend a lot of money on pills that we uh, cost a lot of money, but we have a device that we can use on every, every session. It just hangs off the heart rate monitor. You basically charge it when you, when you charge your watch, you charge, charge the device. We don't even take it off the belt when you're charging it. We just hang it, it sits on the belt, put it in the charger while we're charging your watch, and suddenly you can accumulate data with core temperature from all the sessions you're doing in different climates and you will start to understand and you're, gonna be, you're building big data sets that allows you to understand what are your strengths, what are your limitations, and of course when you start to understand this you can also start to target your limitations and work on this as well. So for us, data is a huge part of how we really advance our training planning and that's why we also know that we are still not a peak human performance. We know that we can race faster. Uh, I'm gonna even say that if we have been racing Ironman, continue to race Ironman and only focus on that now for the two next years, we will probably see that the marathon times, no change in the swimming times, maybe minutes faster for Christian and Gustav, but basically very small changes. The bike, no power output would probably not change very much at all. It is probably where it shall be more or less, plus minus. The only thing maybe air, aerodynamics will, will change because we get better sensors and data for that as well. Where we really see things are changing in Ironman is basically the run times are starting to come down and they will come down even more. I think that for two, or more, two more years, one to two more years of racing, I, I'm sure that we will be able to, to stabilize Ironman run times like in a course like this. I don't expect to see this yet, but around 2.30 and actually for faster courses down to 2.25 where the breaking two limit is for Ironman, I don't know, but probably not faster than 220, but maybe between 220 and 225. But that means also that if you're running a 240 marathon, you're gonna be a slow marathon runner in an Ironman over the next years, uh, that's for sure. You need to come down to 235 and probably down to 230 to really hang in moving forward. But the only way to know this is that we really have to dig into the data because you never have the answer before you actually try to do something with this and learning as you go. And if the only way you can test this 
is that you have to do an Ironman that's extremely invasive, of course, and it's, it's going to be a long time between each time you're really going to peak and you'll be able to push this. Data would allow us to get indirect feedback, understanding the changes as we go when we are starting to accumulate more data. So again, data and all these things comes down to is basically being able to ask questions and you can look into the data or historical data you have and start to understand differences, individual performance signatures, and maybe even target, okay, this is something I, I want to see if I can do something with. And then as you train now, you can start to actively adjust it because you're seeing the changes as they, as they, go, as they go, instead of that you are making a plan, you're starting to train, and the next time you're going to look at, did it work or not, was when you're racing. That's a little bit too late to start to make adjustments. Okay, you can always start to make adjustments after the next race, but this is almost like accounting in the way that if, when, if you're running a company, you would never say, how say, not check your balance on their account, looking at how much money is coming in, how much money is going out. Because if the only time you're going to do that is by the end of the year, worst case, you have a huge credit and not actually, uh, or huge debt instead of actually having a lot of money on your account because you actually didn't know how much you actually got in and how much went out. And that is something that sensors allows us to, to track much better. We can actually say, okay, this is what we want to improve. And you can see whether the data is changing or whether the performance actually is improving or not. Or at least you can understand, well, you see there's a change in performance. We can start to understand why there's a change in performance. And that allows us also to be much more proactive because it allows us to actively adjust the training and actually arrive at an Ironman or Olympic distance race or whatever it is, whether it's whether you're driving a F1 car or whether you are uh, sailing or whatever, it allows you to basically understand what is changing and basically be proactive and change as you go much faster. So data, it really enables us to ask questions that we have not been able to do before and we can look retrospectively back to what actually did change or what did happen.